coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. It starts with just a trickle, but over time the river swells and rips open the earth to divulge dark, forbidden treasures. What spirits lay in wait to guard the sacred bounty of lost bones? What's it like to see beyond the veil? From highway spook light standoffs and weather-wielding house ghosts to unexplained footsteps and clandestine rendezvous with otherworldly craft, we unearth these strange but true stories of the inexplicable and the unknown. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury, in. close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are demons, Specters, Spirits, spirits Sleep Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. I know, right? That was so weird. Oh, hey, guys. Oh, hey. Funny you catching us here. <laughs> Mid-conversation. So natural. <laughs> well, hello, hello. Hello, Jeremy. I'm John. And I was Jeremy. <laughs> and I'm Chris. Welcome to Beliefful. Yes, welcome to another exceptional episode of Strange True Stories from Listeners. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a special one. Got some good stories today. Yeah, yeah, Strange Stories 10. These, I think, are my favorite. I love the research episodes, but these are nice because we get to listen to what our listeners are experiencing out there in the world. Yeah. People that we know. There's plenty of strangeness to go around. Yeah. I mean, it's great to hear some crazy stories online or read them in books, which we do a lot of both of those. But to get them from people to listen to the show that we can actually talk to have personal experiences it makes it a little more real. Yeah, we got some really interesting stories on this episode. Like what, Chris? Well, we've got everything from haunted woodland skulls to back road UFO standoffs. Did you hear about this one? It's no. going to be good. Yeah. Weather bending house ghosts. I'm excited for that Wait, one. W- my brain's working that out. Um, harp? Yes. It's a harp ghost. It's a ghost of a scientist who worked at harp. And he arrived in someone's home in New Jersey. (laughs) He still has access to the tech. No, not quite that. It's more of a supernatural ability to control the weather. Like psychic cloud seeding? Ooh, I like that. And there's a bunch of other stuff we're going to get into today. Really great stories. The longer we do the show, the harder it is to select stories for these episodes because really, truly, like going back and going through the archive, there's so many I want to do, but I know we only have so much time per episode to to do these. They keep getting better. They keep getting better. And there are people that have sent in stories months ago. There's a lot of interesting stories out there. We are trying hard to get to all of them. But what's great is even stories that we're presenting today, if we get a lot of supplementary information that's really interesting, interesting anecdotes about the areas and things that come along with these stories from listeners' personal accounts, we we don't have time to fit all the details. And we have now listener posts or pages for each story we present that has additional information, some cool images, and even stories that we don't get to. They will eventually all live in our listener stories archive. Strange listener stories archive. So you guys can check those out. It makes it easy to share the stories. If there's any details we didn't get to, you can go there and you can read them and get more tickly in your scary bones. More tickly? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> words. I'm working with my words, okay? I like, uh, I like that. You would creepy, Chris. Um, speaking of creepy, let's get into it. Yeah. I like it. Righteous. I love this time of year, this this August end here, this the ending of I August. I think it's horrible time Well, it's a little here. warm. It's disgusting all right now. That was quite a pushback on Chris's statement. Well, I mean, I like... Hey, it's a horrible time. I just mean the weather has been really, really humid and gross. Ohio's known for its excellent weather all year long. I know. A couple of weeks before, it was 70 and rainy, and mm-hmm. now it's like 95 yeah. and humid. You get a couple of beautiful days in between. This is a very fascinating conversation. But what I was trying to Sorry. say was... <laughs> Aside from the weather, I love this time of year because I don't know about you guys, but I can almost sense that fall is coming. Like there's something about this time of year. The end of summer. Yeah. The veil is, you know, it's getting weak at the bottom. I like fall, but I don't like what comes after fall. 
winner. Well, we're not talking about that, John. We're trying to focus on the spooky stuff. <laughs> fall is pregnant with Halloween. I do like fall. That's what's so great about on it. On today's episode of weather. <laughs> <laughs> He's setting up the feeling. I get it. Yeah. I like it. On the way here through Rogue's Hollow, I already started to feel the ghouls coming out of the shadows. That's all I was trying to well, say. Well, Rogue's Hollow always has ghouls and shadows. That's true, but they're more brave around this time of year. Anyway, yes, let's get our first story going, John. And well, you want to set this one up? You know the story well. You gathered this one. I'm excited. Our first story we have from a listener named Jeff who sent in a really awesome story. Um, happened last year up in Cuyahoga Valley. Kind of a disturbing story, right? Yes. It's definitely a really unique story. This is close to us, by the way. He apparently, he lives up there and there's a very powerful river that resides behind, like he could see it out of his yeah. window. Is it the Cuyahoga? It's in the Cuyahoga Valley. Cuyahoga Valley. I think it's the Cuyahoga River. Um, all right. So I recently moved up to the Cuyahoga Valley in Northeast Ohio, and I found a place to rent because of the river. I really wanted to explore it and see what I could find down there. I knew there was wild animals and different seashells from millions of years ago, the way the river can rip open uh, fresh land. So I ventured down there for a couple months, find a really neat um, little crystallized stones and all this other cool stuff. And that was my main goal was to just find a collection of unique objects. Well, I decided to jump in the river a different way this time. Plunged in, got across it. It's a good 15 to 20 feet across, big deep holes of water. It's always shifting and moving the landscape. And um, as I'm walking up through the rock bed, I find, of all things, a human skull. What? And inside the skull was a relief of Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. And the skull itself and the da Vinci had the same patina, which really caught me. It was a bronzed and gold patina. It looked like it's been just unearthed within the last month or so. Who knows? But this, the way this river can rip open new land, you'd have to think it has not been there for long. Bizarre. Yeah. Well, it obviously took me by surprise. I I couldn't get it off my mind. I decided to just leave it there and keep walking on because it was just early in the day. I'll get that skull later. <laughs> <laughs> and I was venturing down river, finding little bits of this and a little bit of that, but at the same time, I couldn't get the skull out of my head. And um, a couple hours go by, and I found my way back to the, to the skull. And um, right away, I picked up the Da Vinci piece. It was actually hooked into the eye socket. That's crazy. Pulled it out. Oh, what? really was studying. It was just amazing piece. My adrenaline was through the roof. And I was really going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to take this human skull. The whole point of being down there was to find cool stuff and add it to my collection of whether it's, I don't know, feathers or stones, whatever, whatever I find. So anyway, I decided to pick this skull up, at least to examine it. Pick it up, I'm looking at it, turn it over. I said, okay, I think he's gonna come with me for a little bit. He's <laughs> a brave man. So I put it in my bag. And right away, I could sense the atmosphere changing in a way. I jumped Ugh. into the river, started swimming across, and I could just feel the excitement, whether it was because I just found the find of the year or was it something else. And all of a sudden, there was a heavy presence above my head where I could definitely feel like there was something looking at me. So I snapped my head up and there was a blue orb maybe 150, 200 feet above my head. Weird. And it was right over top of me and it was definitely letting itself know that it was watching me in a sense. It demanded to be seen. It was not translucent. It was definitely a, had a, almost like a white milky core Weird. Oh, and it was weird, yeah. illuminating blue with vibrations coming off of it. And it seemed, it seemed big to me for being high up in the sky as it was. Knowing my surroundings, the riverbed is lined with sycamore trees and they grow 60 to 70 feet. And I know it was, it was above the sycamore trees, but it wasn't higher than the top of the valley. Interesting. But it was, it's hard to get a, a full idea how far it was, but it was definitely um, there for me. And I couldn't help but think it was connected to the skull and what I found that day. And um, as I was walking away in a rather fast form because 
At this point, I didn't know if it was just watching me or if it was protecting this artifact that I found. And um, I didn't feel too threatened. So I decided to keep walking as I was watching the orb. And it just slowly started ascending. And then it started moving north up the Cuyahoga River as I was watching it. And it flashed and disappeared before my eyes. And um, it's been with me. It's been a strong presence. You don't hardly forget something like that. Creepy. That'd be dude. such a disturbing feeling, yeah. dude. I mean, so many odd aspects to that story. Well, first that he found a human skull. Yeah, that's that definitely is how it starts the whole story. Yeah. But obviously, the more compelling part is the orb that was connected well, to the that's, skull. Yeah, I mean, that's, so he said that he spent a lot of time down there, like looking for stuff. That was kind of right. one of his hobbies. Awesome hobby, by the way. Yeah, super cool. It's I just mean, a great way to spend time outside. Here's man. a seashell. Here's a coin. Oh, here's a skull with a painting in it. I'll take it home. Well, kind of what's interesting, I did get a chance to talk to him, and he said that, first of all, that wasn't the only body that he saw down there. Really? What? In yeah. the Cuyahoga Valley? Yes. And Guess where I'm not hiking anymore. <laughs> well, this is kind of his theory on why it's happening, because he was in the river a lot looking oh, for right. stuff. Mm-hmm. But the way he talked about how aggressive the river is and how it can just churn up stuff. Rip open new land. I he's like that. thinking that it was potentially from the Civil War right. or even a cemetery that got washed away at some point. Yeah. I want to know this Da Vinci. I mean, there's that's a, yeah. that's a very important detail in there. So this the Last Supper... It was in the skull, so... It it wasn't connected. Okay, it sounded like it was a a painting done and put in the skull. It wasn't put in the skull. He doesn't think. He's not 100% sure, but it wasn't, like, connected to it. It was in the eye socket, right? but it wasn't, like... like, washed up into it, maybe? It was, like, washed into it, which is even weirder. (laughs) But it must have... Yeah, I see what you're saying, like, that kind of spiritual connection to the skull. And then the orb. The weird thing, though, that he mentioned when they were dredged up, maybe they were dredged up at the same time, but the fact that they had the same patina. Right. So the same aging on it. That's true. I think that the the answer here is obvious, and I can't believe that we haven't just thought about it already. Cattle mutilations? No. Uh, <laughs> river pirates, duh. River uh, pirates. Transporting <laughs> contraband and expensive ancient artifacts, uh-huh. valuable ancient artifacts, through the Cuyahoga Valley were attacked by marauding Native Americans uh, as someone died, and then Christian you know, river pilots who would be carrying pictures of the Last Supper. Probably missionaries. Yeah, that makes sense. Missionary pirates. No, but very bizarre story. Yeah. Makes you want to go back. You know, John, this is the place where we do our brotherly river walk, the three of us, every year. We do? Cuyahoga Valley. This is that same river. When do we do brotherly river walk? What are you talking about? We did it at least two uh, years in a row. That's not the... Technically the Cuyahoga Valley. It's part, it's the same river. Is it really? Because mm-hmm. that's not a very intense river. Well, technically, I think it's in the Cuyahoga Valley, but it's not the Cuyahoga River there. Yeah, no, this is like a powerful river. Yeah, but river. the reason I was thinking of that was because when we do those walks, I, I'm always fascinated by these layers, right? As yeah. you're walking through, there are these layers of, of sandstone or whatever it is near the waterfall. Right, right, where you can just see the thousands of years, different rock layers. But just looking at that, and you're like, oh man, like I could see bones sticking out of there. Yeah, I mean, and that, like you mentioned, John, the most interesting aspect, obviously, is the orb connected to it. The fact that I love the image of it being, first of all, following him once he picks it up. It's yeah, like it's so strange. This, dude. Either like, like you said, like a protective kind of mm-hmm. force being, or, or I mean, you don't want to think it's the former inhabitor of the. He sul- said of the skull. he didn't think that that's what okay. It, it felt was something like. else watching. Yeah, he felt like it was definitely connected to him picking up that artifact. Which right. makes obvious sense. It I could mean, have been something, I mean, do you think of forests, you think of like fairies in the sense of hidden entities that maybe are curious and maybe are protective of sacred things in the forest, whether it's someone who passed away, their remains or whatever. It's a Raiders of the Lost archetype deal. You're mm-hmm. taking something sacred and, and, whatever and special. That, that freaking Da Vinci painting. That, yeah, that is weird too. I mean, that's an interesting idea, but I think the obvious thing that jumps out is like, yeah. River pirates? Dead person's <laughs> skull. Uh-huh. Uh, then a blue orb. Blue orbs are associated with spirits. Dead person's spirit. Right. I mean, that's, that's the obvious I would, connection. That's what I would think. Yeah. I also asked him, so you sure it wasn't like technology? You oh, know, like, like a drone I thought it or might something? have been a UFO or something. Like he said he, it did not feel like that. It felt like energy. It was technically in the valley, like 200 feet up, but still inside the valley, like, that's kind of interesting because that, to me, says this was inside. It was watching from a close location, not way up in the sky, just happened to be floating. It seems more present. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
that makes well, sense. Well, if it was technology, if it was the 200 to 300 feet, it definitely wasn't an aircraft. I don't think there's an airport. Well, I, I didn't even mean like drone or something. I meant like a hyper advanced craft. Oh, right. I mean, the way you described it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of my UFO sighting, how it had like the pulsing lights. Right, like the lava look inside, yeah. except white instead And he of, did say it had like kind of a pulsing feel to it, but it wasn't like there was anything solid there. It was like yeah. light. It was like translucent. We should find out if we can get a kind of a close specific location. I'd like to go up to this area. Oh, I know where it is. Oh, you do? Okay. Mm -hmm. He said the area is just really a magical place. Yeah. We're not far from You there. want to know what's really strange, John? I don't think I've told you this. I have super synchronistically. Maybe I did tell you. About a week ago, I found a piece of a skull in a river. What? Did I tell you that? No. Isn't this bizarre? This is in the creek in Doylestown. Yeah. So in Doylestown, Rogues Hollow, there's a creek that runs through Silver Creek. I remember you do mentioning this. Yeah. And I think it's, so I'm not sure if it's the, the Silver Creek, but it's there was silver mining in the hollow down here. And uh, I was walking there the other day, beautiful area. And this piece that I thought was like pottery or something was just kind of under the water, but out of the rocks. And so I, I grabbed it. And as I was polishing it off, it was so ridiculously smooth. Like it had been there for a long, long time. And at first I was like, oh, this piece of like pottery. And it had, it had like browns and blacks, like almost like it had been charred or burned. And as I was cleaning it and looking at it, it had like this kind of, you know, that seam when two pieces of skull plate come together mm -hmm. around the ocular eye socket, there's like this kind of seam mm -hmm. and that's what it had. And then I was like, this looks just like yeah. bone. And it, it just looked like an eye socket to me. But if it is an eye socket, it belongs to a giant because it's, it's very large. Or a mammoth. Or a mammoth. A mammoth. A mammoth. Yeah. Do you still have it? Yeah. But I, you know, I did one of these things where I, when I was taking it, I was like, okay, I'm hoping it's from a mammoth, maybe a giant. I don't think it belongs to like a regular <laughs> a human. Giant. And I like, I out loud said, if anything is here that's protecting this thing or, you know, permission from the previous owner of the skull, I'm, yeah. I'm taking this out of like respect and curiosity. I, maybe you want to be in the river, maybe you don't. I hope the rest of your body's not here, but maybe I'll come back. But I, I was careful about that right. and, sin and sincere about it. You should and, take it to well, somebody. Just like Jeff. When yeah. He took it and was like, ah. But he was so like, because that's what he was doing down. It was like finding the cool shit. That yeah, was absolutely. part of the reason why he took it. Yeah. It's because he's down there to find cool shit. Like right. if, if you had just been a random person, you probably would have never picked it up to begin with. Yeah. You'd probably call the police like most people. Right. But uh, Jeff's a special guy. Well, he wanted the coolest shit. Yeah. So he's like, how can I leave a skull with a, you know, a That's picture true. of the last supper in there. Like I'd never forgive myself. If you are purely yeah. at your heart, a treasure hunter of odd things. Yeah. It's That's like, that's the mother. That's the Holy grail yeah. of treasure. So what, what was the ending though? Does he still have this orb attached skull? He, he put that back. Okay. That's what I would do. Yeah. I'm not a brave enough well, man. I would want to put it back too. After I had an orb follow me. <laughs> yeah. You think. Yeah. Bad juju. But the whole thing is just such just, a crazy story. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. I wonder if that's some sort of tradition somewhere to like put artwork in skull. Like I know he said it, it oh. seemed like it just happenstance arrived in the dude. socket of the eye. But what if there is, cause you always think about like, dude, sorry, it was cut you off, but it could be part of a barrel because when I buried my chinchilla, yeah, it definitely <gasps> could. I buried oh, I it. Think about this. I buried Chelsea, my chinchilla. Okay, do we really have to bring this up? Yeah, because it's a specific connection. In an ice cream bucket, I buried her <laughs> with a picture of Jesus. And on the back of That's it, right. I was small. On the back of it was a map to get back to the house in case she <laughs> came back. And she did come back because I buried her in a creek bed. And in the spring, she rose back to the surface on Easter. She didn't actually come out of the, the okay, ice cream, ice cream thing, though. Yeah, she was. <laughs> but yeah, good. I think that's a very real possibility that. It was a, it was a blessing, burial prayer part of the, yeah, especially since it's the same color. That's crazy. But uh, it's weird that it's got stuck in the, yeah, it makes sense though, because at first I was thinking it might've been like a necklace or something, you know, that's what I initially imagined, but it was just stuck in the eye socket. Yeah. So it could have just been part of a burial, got washed up and. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> it still doesn't explain the orb. <laughs> no, it does not. Well, terrific story, Jeff. Yeah, thank um, you for submitting that. I hope that uh, it has not followed you home. And if you find anything else crazy out there and have more experiences, definitely let us know. But yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. We should go out there sometime. Yeah, I hope that spirit, if it was a spirit, is, is resting now. He was tired. Of following Jeff around. Okay, let's go to the next story. Yeah, so what do we have next year, Chris? All right, well, we're going to totally mix it up here with the next account. This came from a listener of the show, uh, Tracy, and I was excited when he reached out. And it wasn't to share a story initially. It was just to say, great job, really enjoying the episodes, especially the recent UFO disclosure stuff. He actually spent time on the USS Nimitz in the 90s. Oh, that's right. And if that doesn't sound familiar to you, then you've been living under a rock because the USS Nimitz is the recently infamous Navy ship that David Fravor and other people who had witnessed this tic-tac-shaped UFO in 2004 
had been stationed. We've talked about that before. We covered that, right? Yeah, we did a big breakdown this season and last season. We touched on it when it first, first kind of happened. broke. So when he reached out to say, you know, he was really enjoying the show, I was like, hey, if you have, have you had any strange experiences out there? Like, I don't want to push for any stories, but, and he came back with like, well, I have a short story. This is a pretty fascinating account here. And I think the recent folklore of the Nimitz itself, I think it adds a little credence to his account. Oh yeah, definitely. So this comes from Tracy while aboard the USS Nimitz. I was stationed on the USS Nimitz from 1994 to 1997. The ship was doing workups for the preparation to do a world cruise from Bremerton to Virginia. We spent a lot of time off the coast of San Diego, and the only real time you would have to yourself was at night. I would go to the fantail, or the very back of the ship at night, and enjoy the California evenings. We would always have one other ship behind us for safety reasons, but it was always very dark, and the noise from the water was calming. This particular night, I was out roughly midnight or later with a friend. We were just chilling after a long day. Our ship began to slow to a crawl, barely moving, which wasn't too uncommon, and we didn't think much of it. It was a normal California night, overcast, cloudy, and with both ships at crawl, my friend and I suddenly noticed a huge round ship or aircraft hovering at the cloud line. It made no noise, and it just stayed in one spot for a good 10 minutes. It was very large and round, and you certainly could make out multiple lights. It kind of reminded me of Independence Day, when the large ship comes to Earth. Not like the pyramids, it was very close and made absolutely no noise. Of course, it being dark and overcast, you couldn't make out any marking or clarification of what it was. Typical story, of course. After what seemed a long period of time, the craft again, without making a noise, lifted up into the clouds and was gone. Shortly after, our two Navy vessels fired up, and off we went. It was very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it was. The next day, we told our story to some of our coworkers, and they figured it was a tall tale. I would have thought the same, but I was there. Most likely some military aircraft, but a creepy cool night. That's an eerie visual to me. And by the way, this is off the coast of San Diego, and the Nimitz encounter with the Tic Tac UFO, it was 100 miles off the coast of San Diego. Same it's area, same area. Same ship. So these, this could be part of an underground, maybe a submerged civilization advanced, or maybe... You want to say UFO base? A UFO base. Because you, you hear that a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stories of coming in and out of the water. Right. Interesting timing, too, that the ships, just as they slow to a crawl, they notice this thing, the thing leaves, and the ship fires back up. Maybe it was a clandestine meeting. Maybe the higher-ups in the ship were like, oh, we're going to meet uh, General Zhao from uh, Submerged Spaceship 5 at this time. From the Valerian civilization. Yeah, we'll go out in our invisible meetup buoy. Yeah, that, uh, that was the interesting thing. The idea that his ship and then the other ship that they were with slowed to a crawl, and then suddenly he's walking out back and then notices the ship in the cloud line, this giant circular craft with these lights. And they're just staring at this. It's there for 10 minutes. And then as soon as it like lifts off, and I'm just imagining like the clouds kind of like lifting up with the suction of this thing as it silently drifts into the sky. And then right after it moves away, their ships start up again. And there's no notice of why the ship slowed or why they started again. It just, it was just something that was kind of unusual, but it just, it occurred at the same time that this thing appeared. And then mm. right after it left, just made me wonder what you're saying, Jerry, like, was this some sort of operation or some sort of meeting or, I mean, who knows, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Or maybe just something that they wanted to uh, kind of quietly observe mm -hmm. when they noticed it in the area with the radar or something. Yeah, very interesting. Great story, Tracy. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Great connection with the uh, Tic Tac, which is now a famous part of UFO lore and legend. Absolutely. Let's take a quick break. All right, we'll be back. On this week's expansion episode, will encounter the uneasy sensation caused by an open attic door in an otherwise empty home. Most of you have experienced the hair-raising feeling that accompanies the suspicion that you may not be alone in your house when you are certain you should be. Your home is usually the safest and most comfortable place you know, 
which is what makes it so disturbing when you realize something is watching you from the crack of your bedroom door. By that, but you know, with the distraction, everything going on, trying to figure out getting the plumbing fixed and all stuff, she doesn't really focus on that too much. Then, this is about six months into having this place. She's been working every day, working all these jobs, rarely home. After this puppy incident, she gets sick and has to stay home from work. First time since she's been living there. She's home all day. Seven o'clock, she's watching her stories and she hears some kind of thumps coming from the bedroom. She's out in the living room, you know, watching her shows and she's thinking, well, I have cats, they're jumping around. You hear noises, mm -hmm. you know, not thinking too much about it. 11 o'clock rolls around, getting ready for bed, turns off lights, decide to take a bath, candle lit, so it's real dark, real romantic. She gets in her bathtub, and from her bathtub, she can see the hatch to the attic. It's open. Uh -oh. Hatch to the attic is open. Did the dog open it? Great question. <laughs> Probably not. It did get in the sink by itself. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> so... When she sees the hatch open above her, she said everything slows down. Yeah. Like oh, she, yeah. She realizes someone is in the house, and then you know, she the, starts putting the sound, the, and it goes, boom. Yeah. I just assumed you'd put that in okay. after. <laughs> if you enjoyed that clip, head over to bleafhole.com and hit the expansion button to get access to all of our extra episodes. We're back. Welcome back for more creepy stories. Cue lightning strike. <laughs> Writing on the wall. Writing on the wall. I just read that from an email. Well, oh, <laughs> good input. <laughs> While you were talking, I was reading my email and this is what I had read. Very applicable. I thought I kind of went with it. You see the writing on it the did. wall. It did. It sounded creepy when you said it. I was like, oh, yeah. is that a listener story? You're like, no, oh, it's my email. Well, it was a, it was a l creepy listener story email. Oh, oh was it really? Nice. <laughs> Silently winks. <laughs> okay. Well, what do we got, Chris? Okay. This next story is pretty fascinating. You know, the concept of being a magnet for spirit or for entities, right? Or for just strange occurrences in general. Uh, we get a, quite a number of submissions of people that seem to have ongoing situations. This is an interesting one from James Day. I call this a menagerie of lingering companions. I'll preface my story with this. I have things attached to me, one unknown, all are shadowy figures unless otherwise stated, and they are as follows. A large, yellow-eyed frog, Ooh. a hulking man-shaped figure, a Courage the Cowardly Dog type cat, triangle face included. So that's, for those who don't know, it's a cartoon from the early 2000s, late 90s. Oh yeah, the Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah, so there's a cat entity in there that has a sort of triangular face. Almost looks a little demonic in a way. With but the, is it a cart... He doesn't see a cartoon. He's just describing, I think, the shape of oh, it. Oh, similar to that. Yeah. Not drawn. I mean, maybe a cartoon, I don't know. Probably not, but still creepy. A shadow ball that lurks in corners where I sleep. A little boy who's a good guy. And an old woman. Ugh, never liked the old woman. Definitely a collection of unique entities there. Yeah, interesting. You hear this as a kind of a familiar theme too. Some people just seem to be magnets and sometimes you really get a sense that they have experienced something throughout their life, which I think is definitely possible. Well, there's there some people that write to us, they have these ongoing things with different spirits or entities, not even necessarily spirits. Right. So we don't know what these are. It could be interdimensional feeders, who knows? I think we, especially when you have the more bizarre things like a yellow eyed frog. Yeah. These things have been with me for most of my life. The little boy and old woman being the only two I have an idea of where I pick them up. This is a story of black-eyed children and an entity I fondly and fearfully refer to as House Ghost. It was a random night. We were having a small get-together and playing with Ghost Radar Classic. By the way, this is a app you can download, uh, which I did last night briefly until it indicated there were two entities at either window at 2.30 in the morning when I was researching, and so I immediately turned it off. Yeah, thanks for using my phone for that. Ghost, so what is it, just scan where they are? Yeah, allegedly. Uses technology within the phone to sort of read signals of vibration. You know, of course, there's some insane claims. And when I read what it features in there, like reading the spectral plane or something, or reading the quantum flux a little, uh -huh. 
For two ninety nine or free with advertisements, <laughs> you can read the quantum flux around you to see what <laughs> entities exist. Yeah, interesting. Some of these apps, I think, get lucky with some of the that there are things that could actually be picked up, <sighs> but a lot of it is awesome. <sighs> Seems like a stretch, but yeah, which one? We did like an EVP episode. Oh, yeah. Not EVP, it was something along those lines. and An early ghost tech. We yeah, tested it. And uh, it was like saying like brothers believe. Oh, I forgot like, about that, dude. Laughter. Yeah. Dude, maybe we could drop that clip if we... Oh, dude, that was creepy. Mm-hmm. And then that was right around that time that I had the ghost interaction in my house. We were pinching Jake. Oh, yeah, and whistling, right? And whistling. Yeah. Before that happened, I did it by myself when I was working and it was like freaking me out. I had it on for like a minute and it was like telling me like, yeah. I can't remember what it was saying, but I was like, okay, I'm shutting that off. I would not expect you to do that by yourself. Well, I was yes. doing it because I was making a stinger that had like oh, that okay. quick Sounds. tuning. So through. you wanted that effect. Yeah, I wanted to have that sound. And it was like, John, <laughs> I'm in your room. Pay attention. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be, you'll be experiencing that again because I'm sure during the sound design of this episode, you'll, I'm sure you'll be playing with that. It's interesting because I had a similar experience and I probably mentioned this on the show before, where I turned one of these apps on just to just to see. Because I think your first instinct is like, well, how is an iPhone going to be able to read this this and that? But I was sitting under an archway that led from one room to another. And my name is Christian. And the first thing that popped up was Christian. And the second oh, the this. second thing that popped up was archway. And I was sitting under no, an archway. No, it was threshold. Threshold. And I was oh, sitting weird. like, it was just weird. I was like, okay, I remember that. And I think point being, and I'm going to get, get back to the story real quick, but point being... Even if the claims are overhyped, and even if the technology isn't quite what under delivers to be, or under delivers in cases, I think like any tool, it can be manipulated to right. deliver results, like things that are unintentionally receivers for communication. Right. Whether it's like an old microwave, radio, VCR, Super NES, Super NES. So that's Mario. I don't know if you've heard of that. But continuing on here, there's one out the window. Weird. It says Jeff. What? No. 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 Yeah. J J J J. E E E E F F F F. What? That's weird, man. It knows our dark secret. Is that John. the blue orb talking through the app? It's looking for Jeff. That's weird. That is kind of weird. J J J. Why does it do the multiple? Letters? I don't know. Where, let me see what it looks like. It's like a, a string of numbers. Oh, letters. weird. So I don't think it's actually spelling anything, but it's like a series of numbers or letters. So you can see at the bottom, kind of scrolling. Oh yeah, yeah. But it was J E E E J J J J E E. Wow, that is weird. All right, let's get back to okay. the story. We can okay. d- do an experiment after this. I'm sure, John, the whole time I'm reading this, you're going to be not paying attention and looking at the Okay, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> let's do it after this. All right, here we go. Uh, jumping back into his story. So, But this is sort of the impetus for what kicks off this evening for James. It was a random night. We were having a small get-together and playing with Ghost Radar Classic. A good time as usual. We were aware of House Ghost at the time, but decided to mess around anyway. In the past, House Ghost has gotten into a car with me and traveled to another town where he stayed and tossed furniture in a hotel for a week until I went back to see a sibling. He hitched a ride back home with me. Both terrifying drives. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. You you get that sensation when you feel like someone's in your backseat? You know, Mm -hmm. probably just psychological. Imagine just knowing that there is something, a presence that was in your hotel room and then something followed you. In your car, you're on a long drive, it's just there the whole time. Mm -hmm. Very uneasy. Who controls the radio? Yeah, because when are they getting out, you know? That's enough, house ghost. <laughs> I've had enough of you. <laughs> On this random evening, my brother's wife noticed a kid standing across the street staring at the house in the evening. You guys see that? There's some kid over there. Oh, yeah, weird. Odd, but whatever. We were inside having a good time. House ghost was not pleased that we were playing around, so he decided to get involved. The Ghost Radar app started calling out what we were doing, and more specifically, what I was wearing and who I was. This is going to sound familiar, John. It called out, quote, Brother. And, quote, America. I am in a fraternity and was wearing a sweatshirt that has the words Captain America on it. Oh, weird. That was it for Ghost Radar that night. I made some noises down in the basement for the rest of the night. We locked the door and put some furniture in front of it. Why don't you turn it off, though? I think they did. I think that's the point. Oh. Is that it continued to make, make noise? noises. I mean, that's my assertion. Maybe that's okay, not true. That's your assumption. Yes. You're asserting your assumption. I am. <laughs> um, nothing more from him that night. But then it started raining. Cut to an hour or two later, the rain just stops. It was a heavy downpour and should not have stopped like that. 
Then there was a knock at the kitchen door. The door is behind the house, not visible from the streets. I almost flipped out, and none of us went to the door. We froze in place and waited. Another knock. Same as before. What felt like an eternity passed and then... Rain. Just like before the knocks. Full, heavy rain. Decided not to sleep after that. Cut again to a couple more hours later. And it happens again. Rain stops. Knock at kitchen door. The exact same as before. This was too freaky. And again, we did not move a muscle. Second knock. Rain comes back. Our theory is that house ghosts got pissed that we were taking things lightly and sent a black-eyed child to our house, as well as influencing the app to put us in our place. I will never go to that house again, and I actively avoid even driving past it. My own personal belief is that I'm easy to attach to, and that it was grooming me for either possession or some other nefarious purpose. I hope to never know. Thanks for listening, James. Good story, James. Maybe delete the Ghost Radar app, though. Yeah. Especially if you're, like, susceptible. If you're concerned about more attachments and possession, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe avoid any sort of communication. That's yeah. definitely creepy about the rain stopping and yeah. starting. And I the can knocking. Just, it's very cinematic. It has notes of demonic activity there with, with the weather Reminds manipulation. Of, yeah. Zozo. Very similar story with Zozo, but oh, yeah. same thing. You're playing, well, he said they're taking it lightly, so you're kind of playing with this tool, not taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. And you are opening up an intention for something to come through. It's always a risky business. Yeah, and and Zozo's more of a controversial story of the legitimacy of those accounts, but but based on a real experience people have. But what's fascinating is, and I'd love to do his story sometime, a classic, relatively recent story in the paranormal library of accounts, uh, famous accounts. Um, I don't know if you guys, this story sound familiar to you? I, I, I can't recall his name at the moment, but it was a young man who had been released from prison and went back to his home where his, I think his grandfather had lived. And immediately started being tormented by this, by his, what he thought was maybe his grandfather who had molested him. Very dark story. Ugh. But during this account, it started raining in their home. And not only did it start raining inside oh. the house, but then the, the water would reverse course and start rising in the living room. And there were police witnesses there that testified to this, all this occurring from this guy. This was recent, you think? At least the account was uh, popularized a few years ago. Okay. I thought um, it was a little older, the account, but yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so rain coming up, police seeing this in the house because they were called, right? So first it was the landlord that was called, you know, because it's raining in the house. Is there a leak or something? The landlord comes and is freaked out. As the landlord's there, the water starts rising vertically. Yeah, that's when you're They call the police because who do you call? There's no real life Ghostbusters, unfortunately. Come on, Bill Murray, get your act together. But so they call the police. The police arrive and there's water rising from the floor, going up, going vertical. And then I think the story, and we'll do this account in depth sometime, I'm sure, but it ends with him going back to prison i think at some point and when he's in jail at this point this demonic force that's been with him that he thinks was his grandfather has sort of infested part of his ego part of his spirit or whatever and this is all recorded with police reports he's in his cell and one of the other inmates freaked out by him because he looks he at this point he's kind of being overcome by this thing uh and it's either the jailer or one of the other inmates who like says oh yeah this stuff really happened i heard about what happened uh bullshit let's see some of it and it starts raining in the sheriff's office. Pretty insane. But it just, yeah. so this story just, it has notes of that sort of demonic possession stuff mm-hmm. with water manipulation and weather control. Uh, creepy. Yeah, very. But bizarre. yeah, maybe delete that app. Yeah, maybe get rid of the app. Definitely an interesting story. For sure. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not you, James. I hope you're handling it, brother. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for sending that in. Yeah, good story. I had another friend named Jeff. I know. Maybe that's who the app is calling for. Yeah. Yeah, he had a... Hopefully we still get the story from sometime, but he got attacked by a shadow person. Uh, I'd like to hear that story. Yeah. Well, he, you went with him through that insane asylum, abandoned insane asylum. Yeah, we talked about that because I just talked to him. I mean, this was a long time ago. We went to school with him a long time ago and yeah, we talked about that trip and like he remembered it exactly the way I remembered it. It was mm-hmm. really interesting. That's such a great story. You told that before on our, mm-hmm. our show, Yeah, right? check out the show notes. We'll have a link to that episode. Yeah. Uh, great retelling of that crazy experience in the asylum. And then the... I went and recorded his band in Canada a couple years after, and that's where the shadow person attack happened. At the venue? No, it was at his mom's house. Oh, in Canada? In the basement. Oh, that's creepy, dude. And I was down there a lot by myself. It's where I was sleeping and where I did like all the work. You Really? Uh Uh-huh. I didn't know you stayed at his mom's house. Oh, when you were recording the band? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was thinking when you were going to school there. No. 
Crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> that's a little, I guess, free room board. But yeah, that's crazy, man. Fascinating stuff. Yeah, you should definitely get his story. Mm-hmm. I will. All right. Well, let's get back to the stories we have today. All right. Getting back to the stories today. Let's go across the pond. The story comes to us from Chris from Lancashire. Uh, English Chris. English Chris. Thanks for the submission. Yeah, this is really interesting. We've been meaning to get to this one for a while. Yeah, it was a bit of a challenge because there's so much lore in this area, so much history. You know, that's the lovely thing about Europe in general is there's so much history there, so much known history, so much known history and so many things you can trace back, the recorded history. And his area specifically has, there's a lot of deep history there with a lot of events. Yeah, I was looking into that a little bit because he he provided a lot of information. And this is another thing too, guys. Like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the episode, there are going to be surrounding details to these stories and some of these like especially with Chris's story here, he provided a lot of information about where he comes from, his village, where the stuff happens. And we've included it in the notes about this weird, mysterious area. It'll be there. But we do know he comes from Easton on the Hill. That's the name of his village. Kind of the key point here is his village had served the local town called Stamford. And this area is, it has just crazy deep history of mystery and lore from being a 9th century Danish Viking trading post, then a hotbed of Elizabethan spy mastery, Awesome. Followed up by being a hangout for legendary highwaymen like Dick Turpin himself, who apparently was a famous highwayman. Dick Turpin? Yeah. Uh, that's like a highwayman, John, if you don't know, it, or Chris, you don't know. Oh, I know what a highwayman are. Okay. There are people that would rob people along the highways and byways back in right. you know, old Carriages English days. and stuff, kind of like very old school uh, English version of, you know, Bonnie and Clyde. We had him here too. I mean, that's true. It's a time period thing. English had just had better highwaymen, but Dick Turpin <laughs> was a famous one apparently, and uh, they'd like write you know, oh, yeah. stories about him and stuff, but he was from the area, yes? Oh, I was just flicking my wrist. Oh, hey. <laughs> well, how a do you do? A little tick in my hand. Oh. You know, like a little movement tick. Maybe it was your spirit um, possession. <laughs> Anyways, just a fascinating area. I'd love to just cover sometime, like mm-hmm. going to the deep history of an area where hauntings and things take place. I think that'd be really fun. But uh, just to paint a little bit of that history for you of the area, Easton on the hill. <laughs> nice. Let's get into the story. It's called An Uninvited Guest or Home Alone-ish. Uh, he titled this An Uninvited Guest and I gave it a kind of a silly title. Home Alone-ish. His title's better. Honestly, I can't remember the occasion, but I'm going to assume that my mom had convinced some of the extended family to come round for us all to go out for lunch. We never did much as a family together, so it's a fairly safe bet. It's the only good reason that everyone would be out at the same time in any numbers. Whatever the reason, mom thought I was in dad's car and vice versa. They left for, if it was mom's favorite restaurant, an hour round trip, leaving me home alone. This is a time before mobile phones, remember? No WhatsApp groups or messaging between cars. They wouldn't have even found out I was missing for at least 30 to 40 minutes. I can remember it was a calm, warm day, English springtime. That was how I'd been forgotten. So sad. (laughs) Because I'd been sat outside reading behind the house in the rose garden. Some important points about my house and village. There has been a farm on top of the hill since before the ninth century. It's an ancient part of the countryside. The local town has been a busy trading point since the Vikings invaded and moved south into England. And was where Boudicca chased the Romans south over the river at Stamford around 61 AD. She's a fascinating character. She's an Icenian queen or something? Yeah, basically like a Celtic character pushing back that crazy invasion from the Romans. She's a warrior queen, right? Right. That's a whole fascinating time period there with the Druids being eradicated by Caesar. History of his bloody. Mm-hmm. My house, originally bought in the 14th century, served as the alehouse to the hilltop farms, so as one of the oldest permanent buildings in the village. Our kitchen has the original fireplace and wooden beams in the low ceiling. It's very prancing pony, if you like your Lord of the Rings references. Oh, we do. Local legend has it that the highwaymen would drink there before robbing people on the trading routes into and out of town. Anyway, I was left alone. I don't remember being freaked out. The family still jokes today that I was an eerily calm baby and hard to rattle as a kid. What I do remember clearly is climbing out on the kitchen countertop to see if the cars had gone. My mom suffered with multiple sclerosis, which kept her in a wheelchair, but didn't stop her driving, her adapted Nissan. 
At our kitchen door, Dad had built a small ramp to get her up the step and had stuck two rubber mats to it for the grip, the same sort of mats you keep in your car footwell. From the kitchen window by the kitchen door, you could see the bar where Mom's car would be, but thanks to the L shape of the house, not see Dad's garage in the other barn. Mom's car was gone. I had to go physically to check for Dad's, leaving the door open behind me, because why wouldn't I? I walked to the edge of the building to see for myself. No car. Damn. Confirmation I was home by myself. I turned around and crossed the paved area back towards the door and stopped in my tracks. On the right-hand rubber mat, facing into the house, was a large, wet, human footprint. My clearest memory of this whole thing is first looking around me at the paving to see where the print had come from, but seeing none leading up to it over the dry slabs. Then measuring it against my own foot to see it was definitely adult sized. Just inside the kitchen door was a collection of walking sticks mom had used before the wheelchair, and it took all the courage I had to reach through and grab one. My last memory of being in the house was being stood at the bottom of the stairs, too terrified to go up or call out. Not long after, Dad came home for me. Naturally, as soon as they arrived, wherever they went, they noticed I wasn't with them, and he turned around to come get me. I told him about the footprint, which by then had faded to almost nothing. He went around the house opening doors, probably humoring me, but we never spoke of it again, which is the traditional English way of dealing with problems. I've remembered that day my whole life. I'm 37 now. Mom and the mats are gone, but I still look at the paving slabs every time I go home. Thanks, guys. I love what you do. I hope my memory gave you a chill. All the best. English Chris. Yeah, it's a good story. When the parents are away, the spirits will leave wet footprints on your floor. Well, you could have said play. I like Jeremy's better. Thank you. Because it was unexpected. Oh, you subverted my expectations, That's what sir. I was planning on. Yeah, uh, that last line, too, is interesting to me, that something that's stuck with him. It's like a weird nostalgic memory, the whole yeah. thing with the... It reminds me of like the old style of like a romantic sort of Victorian ghost story mm-hmm. where there's an emotional attachment at the same time of this, like there's a connection to your memory, your your love of that area and that the family time there, but at the same time mixed in as this spooky, not extremely terrifying or demonic, but just unexplained event. It sounded like he was pretty scared. Oh yeah, definitely. That's one of those time periods in life where you like come online yeah, for exactly. the first time where you're put in a situation that's really terrifying and all your innocence leaves at that point. Yeah. And you kind of grow up a little bit more probably. The world isn't as safe as I'm sure your parents make it. Right. And all of a sudden you're snapped into real world like intruder. And yeah, the fact that like still when he goes home, he sees that slab and he always looks for that footprint. Mm-hmm. Like that's how you know that was embedded into his. It's like when I left the gas station the other day and almost ripped the gas pump out of the thing. That was like a month ago, but still every time, I didn't do it. But still every time I leave now, I'm just like, it's clicked into my almost brain. Almost exactly I have to the check. same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess a little different. <laughs> <laughs> now, every time I see a gas tank. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because the wet footprint thing, there's this theme, this motif. Uh, I was curious about that. If this is something spectral with ghosts or yeah. spirits or entities that is a common attribute that you might have in a haunting or whatever. And you do find a, a kind of pattern, which is kind of interesting. They came across this brewery in Michigan called Mitten Brewing Company. I guess it used to be an old firehouse or something. And they had... What part of Michigan is this? Grand Rapids. Oh, cool. Without getting too deep in the story, this guy, he was the last guy in the building, mopping the floor or whatever. So it was wet floor left. First guy back in the morning, footprints, right? Mm-hmm. Not, not a big deal. It was weird, of course. But this ha- this happened frequently. And they'd heard, you know, other kind of phenomena going on. And then at one point when they were like excavating or something, they found this old piece of wood original and it was footprints on the beams, like in this white kind of old chalky footprint. On the ceiling? On, but on the wall. Oh, weird. Facing inside the wall. And this idea of like, are these spirits somehow moving, someone that had passed away in the building or near when it was the firehouse. Yeah. So this is like a theme that seemed interesting. I found an interesting blog on in the show notes that points to this mall in the Philippines, apparently a lot of malls in the Philippines that have these watery children's footprints 
that are left. Weird. It's just interesting. It's strange. It might be kind of cultural in the Philippines. Fascinating. But I got a lot of this information from this great blog from uh, the long forgotten Haunted Mansion, which is dedicated, interestingly enough, to the uh, Disney Haunted Mansion. Uh Oh. (laughs) And there's like these green glowing footsteps. And the guy wanted to know, is this like a thing in ghost lore? Is this... So around the time when that Haunted Mansion was made, apparently there was a lot of these footprints being talked about in... Oh, like spiritual circles and stuff? Yeah, it's weird. It's almost like... It does seem like a classic theme. Right. Like footprints. Like skeletons carrying their heads around. Jack-o'-lanterns. Exactly. It's kind of older feeling of of these... uh, Traditional spooks. Yeah. We'll have examples of that in the show notes. There's just some really interesting stories. The one I wanted to mention takes place in Ohio. Groveport, Ohio. There's a Gap Warehouse. We like the clothing store? Yeah, I'll just read this. It's really short. Get into it. Get into the Gap. Workers at the Gap Warehouse in Groveport have reported many strange occurrences. Doors open and close by themselves. Footsteps can be heard when no one else is around. And there is a feeling of being watched, even when no one else is in the building. Shadowy figures have been seen throughout the warehouse by numerous people. Hearing distinct voices speaking, sometimes asking employees to do things, can be heard when it is quiet. One security guard quit in the middle of the night after witnessing wet footprints appear walking into the lobby. There are just a few samples of strangeness that occurs there. The cemetery that dated back to 1803 was located on the northwest corner of the property, but it was supposedly relocated a few years before the warehouse was built. Never a good idea. The ghosts kind of were idea. highly stylish. <laughs> yes, well, this, they didn't know Gap was moving in. No, but when the recent times, they, they would try the clothes. <laughs> yeah, they came back. Their graveyard was me, but they're like, oh, discounts to the gap. Hey, Grove Park's not far from here. I smell a clothing shopping trip coming. We could head on down. Huh? We could do a ghost investigation and get some cool stylish clothes with stripes through the middle of the chest. That'd be cool. Maybe we could hide out in the rafters until they close and then come down to an investigation, <laughs> which leads me to the expansion episode, guys. But oh, what's that? Do you want to know, John? I do. I'm excited. Guys, what is creepier and more disturbing and unsettling than someone or something unexpected? Invading your domicile, your home, your hearth. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Everyone's had that feeling of like, is someone in here? Whether you wake up in the middle of the night or you come home and you suspect that Mm -hmm. it's a very, very unnerving. Unnerving and very vulnerable. Oh yeah. Yeah. Are they watching me or just the like coming down into your kitchen and like a cupboard is open that you were certain was closed is just for me, like, I don't know, we're in this newer place. You were in the country and and it's a safe town, but still I make sure Jeremy freaking leaves windows open in the middle of the night. I close all the windows every night and lock them. We have a security. This <laughs> is bars the door. <laughs> a little in paranoia. The country. I mean, you're in a rural area, but you have plenty of neighbors like right next to you. It's not no, like you're yeah, on yeah. a farm field no, by right, yourself. Right. Somewhere. No, I'm, but there's a big. There's fields behind us. Yeah, and no, forest right, land. No, it's rural, but yeah, I'm not like out in the middle of nowhere. But the point is, this this is what is coming it's up in scary the expansion. To come down and see a uh, you know a cupboard yeah. open that you thought you would close. And what yeah. could that be? There are a number of things, and we're going to get into that in the expansion episode that I have titled. Something's in the house. Disturbing domicile disturbances and uninvited guests. Redundant. Whether it's neighborly nightmares, freak in-home encounters with unfamiliar folk. Well, so people, right? Potential intruders that you do not want to find in the middle of the house at night. Uh, secret squatters and crawl space creepers. Oh, I remember that one. There's many stories like that. Really? We could do a whole episode on that, but I just have a few samples well, that I grabbed. Frog? Is it called frogging? That oh, is yeah. a thing. Yeah, we talked about a movie about that. There's a movie, yeah. Filmed actually in really Cuyahoga freaky. Valley or Sugar Falls. That was, yeah. Close to the area. It's a really good movie. Super creepy. But it's weird that there's people that actually do that. It's like a hobby. So many. And dude, I'm going to talk about some of the stories in the expansion, but there's so many. We do a whole whole episode episode on that. That would be, I think maybe in Halloween around that time we could do one just because it's such a creepy concept. There are all reasons that people do it, but some of the stories are pretty crazy. This all sounds fascinating. Is there anything supernatural in this? There are also supernatural stowaways. And I'm going to talk about that (gasps) a little bit in there as well. A little more fun for us. I know, John, you're not quite as into the mythology and stuff, but there's a history of hidden house horrors and boogers in the bed sheets. And you're really on the alliteration. By today. boogers, I, I mean. You are so really boogers comes the alliteration from hard there. The goopy glops of glimmer time. <laughs> <laughs> boogers comes from bogeys, right? The boogeyman. Yeah. This kind of ancient idea. And we're going to go through some of those. Boogers comes from bogeyman? Booger is a, an old term for like a boogeyman or a bogey, which is this How ancient did it get idea. turned into a piece of like. Something comes out That's of your nose. That's a great question. What's well, creepier than a little thing in your nose that you just Ew, it's can't a get out. boogeyman in your nose. Sticky <laughs> and green. Um, but no, that's there's some fascinating uh, We're up late. <laughs> some fascinating lore <laughs> and mythology coming from that and crazy experience. I'll just mention this real fast. So I went to grab, I was like, oh, I bet I can find something about the boogeyman. So I found something called the Bogert, 
which is an English idea, this kind of creature, this bogeyman type figure. And I was like, I bet this great book I have called The Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits by Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Great book. I bet there's something in there. So what I did, I went over to the table. I'm getting really excited about this, but it was exciting. I was like, I'll grab the book and check if it's in here. So I went specifically to the table to grab it. As I picked up the book, there was a 40 and Times magazine below it, and it was open, facing down. And the only reason I looked at it and picked the 40 and Times magazine up is because on the back of the 40 and Times magazine, this is a little meta, was a picture of a magazine laying open with its back right. facing up, just like the magazine. It's like, I just had this weird feeling like this is synchronicity. I'll pick up the magazine. Since it's drink. Yeah, I know it's a new drinking game people are playing <laughs> when we say synchronicity. But anyway, so there's a picture of a magazine open with the back facing up on the magazine that's open with the back facing up while I'm going to pick up a book to look for the boogeyman. And guess what was on the magazine? On the magazine? On the picture of the magazine, boogeyman encounters. What? So basically, Jeremy went to pick up this encyclopedia to book. To find something about the boogeyman. To look for boogeyman lore. And as he picks it up, he sees that there's a magazine underneath. And on the magazine, there's a picture of a magazine positioned the same way. He's like, that's kind of weird coincidence. I'll look at this. Maybe there's a, a clue in here, a synchronicity I can follow. He picks up the book, and it's the boogeyman is what's on the issue that's pictured in the magazine that's itself. I know, it's complex, it's but meta. there's so many S and N and E's. Uh, I don't want people to get drunk when they're listening. That uh, that we just I have so many. We should do an episode sometime. Yeah, I stop talking. About I know some people like I get tired of hearing about it because it's one of those things like a dream. Like mm -hmm. you know, is it really interesting if you're just hearing about someone else experiencing it? You kind of have to experience it yourself. Yeah. But I would like to do an episode on it, make it interesting and get oh, yeah. into some of the like the well, Carl Jung type stuff. We talk about the reticular activating system. What is that? It's a pattern recognition system. It's uh -huh. part of our like natural. Right, where you recognize uh, patterns. Psychological. Mm. Oh, okay. It's like a like survival pareidolia mechanism. type thing. It's a survival mechanism. Yeah, that's used a lot to discount conspiracy theory. Yeah, I mean, and same with synchronicity. But some synchronicities are beyond the just reticular like activating system. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Oh, I would just wanted to say to listeners out there who haven't heard their story yet, and if it's around a particular topic, it might be because, for example, synchronicity. I'm saving those for a synchronicity episode. So if you've got a story that relates it's to just, a certain theme. People are getting real wasted right just now. Just one guy. It's just one guy. <laughs> Unless he convinced someone else to do it with him. What was his name? I wish I could say his name. It was a YouTube comment, wasn't it? Was it? Or maybe it was a Might patron. patron. Let us know. I forget. It's hard to keep track of people that write in, but thank you for writing in. Anthony Thon. So to wrap up the wet footprints thing, I thought this was really interesting and a weird synchronicity. So I'm just going to mention it real quick. I want to know if this is also like a thing that people experience, the wet footprint thing that has been around for a while. There is something referred to as the Kikamora. <laughs> Ooh, what's that? Kikamor is a female house spirit in Slavic mythology. She lives behind the stove or in the cellar and makes noises similar to those made by mice in order to obtain food. I guess those that feed mice when they hear them. Is this the lady with chicken feet? Yeah, she's got chicken feet right. in, in this depiction. She's basically a malevolent house spirit from Slavic folklore. And they're actually, the Kikamora was used, or the Kikamori in plural, for the first explanation for sleep paralysis in Russian folklore. Interesting. Not only is this thing disturbing your house, but it sits on you at night. <laughs> Now, this was a synchronicity. There are two different kinds of Kikamoras. The one that comes from the forest is married to Domovi or Domovoy. That's a Russian house, fairy, fae, spirit, whatever you want to call it, that I had researched for the expansion before finding his wife, the Kikamora, for the main episode. Oh, weird. To find the wet footprint tie-in. Just weird connections like that. And at that exact same time, I got an email from a listener. Alexandra Socha. Patron who said that they were interested in Slavic mythology. Right when I went to look for English Chris's story, I found this other story. Said they were interested in Slavic mythology right after I put in the notes. Yeah, Slavic yeah. mythology, female house spirit, Kikamora. Guys, it's all real. <laughs> I, was in, I was right in my ear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, was like, I was tying it in excitedly. Anyways, the interesting thing about the Kikamora is when if you're a house builder and you don't like the people you made the house for, you call the Kikamora. You summon it into the home, and then it basically causes havoc, and it's really hard to get rid of. It takes care of them. It takes care of them, and, and the mob kind of. Someone like yeah. haggled your fee down. <laughs> exactly. You're like, I'm <laughs> going to send a Kikamora out in your home. and you ask for it, buddy. One day you're going to find it behind the stove. You're going to get your just desserts. Does she do anything besides ask for food? Because that's not very scary. She just like clanks her chicken no, no, feet no. around. No, no, no. Yeah, she, she, make, she, she makes a mess. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She, she does anyway, Well, thank you for that story, Chris. That was a great story. Yeah. Glad we finally got to that. That'll be in the show notes, so check that out, guys. Check out these listener stories on their own pages on our website because there'll be some supporting information that's really interesting, I guarantee you. Absolutely. Excellent. All right, this next one comes from a friend of the show, Oscar, who actually has his own podcast, uh, Induced Fear. You guys should check it out. We'll have that in the show notes. Great guy, supporter of the show, 
he had his own experience, and we are going to hear it now. This takes place on a, on a dark and dusty road, a place you might not want to be when you see a UFO barreling down at you. Chris, John, roll tape. I have a tape. This is called UFO Chicken. Oh, yeah, I titled this UFO Chicken. It doesn't really explain what it is, but it's a... Uh, it sounds like a chicken UFO. Yes, that's exactly what it is. A giant chicken. That's like you're playing chicken in a car? I get it. Okay. okay. Well, I'm glad that came through. You guys will understand when you hear the story. Hey, guys. My name is Oscar. I have this kind of short UFO encounter that I wanted to share with you guys. About eight years ago, me and my brother Alex were doing a one-day trip back and forth from California to Arizona, then back to California. We're driving around probably around 11 o'clock at night. There's two lanes going one way, two lanes going the opposite way, and they're separated by a giant dirt median, and then we're surrounded by just nothing but desert, pitch black sky and the desert. And as we're driving down this road, I start seeing this bright light form in the sky, and then start moving back and forth, kind of erratically, but not too crazy. I'm trying to tell myself that's just a helicopter. This is not a UFO. I try to wake up my brother. I'm shaking him, tapping him, trying to get him to wake up so he can help me rationalize this crazy light in the sky. He doesn't wake up, so on my own with trying to figure it out. And when I turn to look back at it, it comes swooping down from the sky, heading straight towards me. I freak out, turn the wheel as hard as I can to swerve out of the way. Luckily, there was no car next to me, or I would have hit them, no doubt. The light just kind of zooms past. My initial thought is, it's somebody driving the wrong way on the road, which is scary in itself. But when I turn to look around, I don't see any tail lights or that light behind us anymore. And my brother woke up in that moment as I swerved because he thinks I fell asleep and I'm swerving off the road. So he gets up saying, are you all right? Are you okay? What's going on? And I just, you, you didn't see that? You didn't see what just passed us? You didn't see what just happened? He says, no. And I don't know how to even say it to him. I was like, there was just a light. There's some Something came shooting towards the car and I had to swerve out of the way. And he, he's like, no, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. And I was like, you, that's, <laughs> that's all I needed was <laughs> for him to say, no, it was just somebody driving the wrong way. To this day... I still don't know what it was. A part of me still doesn't want to say it's a UFO, but I can't identify it. It was a light in the sky that came shooting down towards me, went straight towards the car, and then just disappeared like that. Vanished. Weird. Yeah. So either a UFO or some giant spook light, but I I have no idea. Hopefully you guys enjoy that story. Thanks. Keep up the good work, guys. Thanks, Oscar. That was great. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Spook light. Right? Mm-hmm. I w- should have asked him where he was because there are famous spots across the country where these spook lights, will the wisps around the world. These kind of spectral. Did he say how fast he thought it was moving? It sounded like it was pacing him because he was watching this thing. It sounded like for a, a decent clip where it was going kind of erratically, but he said not when too When it was crazy. in the sky. Right, when he was trying to think like, uh, helicopter? It's like, this is moving strangely. I don't think it's a helicopter. But then it comes down. But then it comes down and at his car. It's very strange. I wonder if, if there was sound. Did he mention if there was... He didn't say anything about sound. Yeah. Maybe if it was, it was I guess if enough. it was a helicopter and you heard that sound, that would have dismissed his question of... Well, I'm sure... If, spook light. if it was a helicopter coming down, he probably would have seen the helicopter. <laughs> That's true. But yeah, uh, interesting story, Oscar. Yeah, I'd like to know where that took place. And you got to wonder how many accidents take place because of renegade flying saucers. Yeah. We'll have a story in the show notes for you guys if you want to check it out. Yeah. Check out his podcast, Induced Fear. Oscar, thank you, man. Very well told story. Weird stuff. There's enough to worry about on the road. Yeah. yeah. Why well, you gotta keep control of your UFO if you're gonna be flying? Yeah, come on, Zeth new. It's frustrating for him since he's the only one and he just still yeah. has that like lingering. Yeah. He said his brother, right? His brother mm-hmm. was there, didn't see it. It does make you wonder if you go all the way with the story, it makes you wonder like, was the brother not allowed to wake up? Was this something that was. Oh, you know, come on. I'm just in the sand, you know? I mean, aren't these. But these, it wouldn't these, affect him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like so many of these things where there should be every reason why someone Come else on. <laughs> could just be the brothers. Maybe he didn't want to drive. Right. It was his turn. And he's like, I'm going to pretend I can't. That's wake up. true too. We've done that before on road trips. And I've, there have been times where Chris is driving and I'm falling asleep and then I'll feel the car move a little. And I'll be like, you okay? You okay? 
Yeah. Because like, you're just, you know that you're not watching the road. Yeah, you can feel the moving of the car and yeah. there's this weird vulnerability. Yeah, I'm always like hyper alert when I'm sleeping in a car. So it's weird that he would be, and I'm, of course, it's it's out there to say, was he being kept asleep? But right. then we always talk about this idea of whatever phenomenon, like a hyper overarching phenomenon that's aware of this paranormal activity or causing this paranormal activity. Ultra terrestrial. Ultra terrestrial idea. Just enough to confound and frustrate people, like blurry photographs can never quite get the this thing is correct. Pretty aggressive compared to a blurry photograph, right? But I just mean like that his brother couldn't wake up. Like that one thing would have would have corroborated his account, but he just couldn't come to right. while his brother is experiencing this. And you could make the argument maybe he was falling asleep and it was like a short dream, mm-hmm. but he did see this thing in the sky before the actual coming down occurrence happened. Yeah, I guess it could be like a. The Chevy Chase moment or something where he's watching this thing, falls asleep, and then <laughs> the car is just coming at him because he's in the wrong lane. Right. But I choose to believe he saw what he saw. Definitely interesting. Definitely curious. Yeah. Curiouser and curiouser. Thank you, Oscar. Great story. Yeah. All right. Our final story on the docket, Chris. What is it? All right. This story comes from Brady. Brady H. He submitted this through a speak pipe, by the way. You can do that on our website where you can leave your own voice message. I didn't, didn't really come up with a great name for this story. Medium? Medium messages from grandfather very creative he might have titled this I, this is a very sweet story yeah this is a sweet story and a good i think an uplifting note to end this strange listener stories episode on hey guys thanks for listening i discovered your podcast about a week ago or maybe a little more i've been binging uh, pretty hard never thought i would consider the existence of gnomes but that's what you've done to me <laughs> so I have a pretty heartwarming story for you. Um, when I was 20 years old, my parents went out of town and they went to a psychic medium. This medium was from out of state. She didn't know my parents at all. She didn't even know their names until they sat down at that table with her. So after it was over, mom started texting me the things that this medium had said and apparently she was communicating with my grandpa who had died about three years before that. He had messages for my parents and my brother and I. The message for me requires a little bit of setup for the full effect. When I was a kid, I hung out with my grandpa a good deal. I spent a lot of time with him after school and during the summers and and all that. And one thing we really bonded over was watching war movies. And there was one particular movie that I really liked, and it had a great soundtrack, and we watched it quite a bit. He probably got tired of it, in fact. But there was one song in that soundtrack that I loved. It was like an orchestral version of Amazing Grace. It was real powerful and dutiful sounding, almost kind of patriotic sounding. It it really uh, put some pep in my step. So when I got older and into high school and I started running track, I would listen to that song before I ran a race because it really got the juices flowing for me, kind of got me amped up. Then when my grandpa died, we played that song at his funeral. And I don't think my parents knew that I listened to this song before I raced. They just knew I kind of liked the song. So when we played it at his funeral, then that song had kind of a new, even more powerful meaning to me. And um, one of the messages that this woman had conveyed to my parents was, tell Brady that Grandpa Larry is there when he listens to the song and he knows the races are for him. That's weird. It's crazy. And I was pretty flabbergasted because I had never really told anybody about that song. I mean, this woman certainly shouldn't have known. Wow. How would you know? Yeah. And, I mean, me personally, when I entered every race, kind of thinking, all right, let's really give it hell and get the gold for Grandpa, because when he was here, he supported me a good deal, and I liked the idea of doing well, and just in the hopes that he could still see me. I just wanted to make him proud. So there was no way that this woman could have known that. I mean, you can't really rationalize your way out of that thing. And it came at a time in my life when my worldview was kind of in a weird limbo. I had grown past that worldview of thinking that humans are just walking, talking meat sacks. 
that just wasn't a very attractive worldview to me. So I was searching for something new, but I have a hard time going off just faith alone. So this was really the catalyst that opened my eyes to the fact that there's another reality that we can't see. There is life after death and that my ancestors are here with me, watching over me and and it, uh, I don't know, it, it impacted me quite a bit. Um, it's uh, kind of a good motivation, you know, going through life thinking they're watching me so I better do the right thing here. <laughs> so. I don't know. I I hope you guys like my story. It uh it impacted me in a big way and opened my eyes and here I am 7 years later on your podcast uh learning about Bigfoot and gnomes and fairies <laughs> and uh Hollow Earth and all that. So You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, thank you again for listening. I'm a big fan and I'm looking forward to uh a lot more content. So keep it coming. Thank you. Thanks, Brady. That's a nice story to end the episode on. Uplifting, encouraging, and makes uh, me think of Uncle John. Dude, yeah. what's so weird about that is the uncle who like inspired us starting this show. Essentially, Amazing Grace was the song that he wanted played at his funeral because he mm. knew he was dying. It was Angel Band was the name of the song. Angel Band was the name. Well, that was the name of the. Group oh, maybe that, that was the name it. of the group. Okay. I think. But the weird thing is that we had a synchronicity too. Or not, I mean. I don't know if you want to call it. Someone's real drunk right now. <laughs> a paranormal hey, experience with that song. Or, or like you could say like a reaching from beyond, if right. you want to call it that, where it was with dad. I forget if he was having a hard time with the funeral or planning or something. And he has no idea how it happened or what happened, but his phone in his pocket started playing the song that we were looking for that John wanted played at his funeral, which was yeah. a version of Amazing Grace. By by a specific band. It's like a almost a soft bluegrass sort of Right, version folk kind of version yeah but just interesting the same song connection with brady's story yeah i mean i always always really enjoy hearing those songs because the stories hear, hearing those <laughs> it's stories too. because i don't know just it, it adds a little bit of levity to yeah life. a little lightness and and knowing that yeah there's life after death and also that your family is watching you unlike pastor penguin Remember Pastor Penguin? <laughs> no. At, uh, was that his real name? Or did he just... That was his real name. That was Grandpa Parfit's funeral. Yeah. Donald. Pastor Penguin. Oh, yeah. Was he like, there's nothing after He this? was like, we all believe that they're here watching over us when they die. There's no one watching you. There's no one upstairs <laughs> don't looking visit, down. Don't visit the grave. Don't visit the grave. What? You are alone. I don't think I was there for that. And I get the argument that like, you know, you can't really come back from this divide, this new life that they move into, heaven, whatever you want to call it. There's the belief that there is no reconnection or, you know, your soul just has this veil separation, which is fine, but it is a very dark kind of yeah. odd direction to go during a funeral. I mean, he's also a pastor too. So he yeah. believes that, you know, you go to heaven and you would return with your family, right? Yeah. I think his message was though that like, they can't hear you. So quit talking to him. Yeah. Like technically they're not here anymore. Right. They're, right. they're up in heaven. It is so. a very weird, dark message. It's just well, a kept, weird point to hammer home at a funeral. I kept waiting for a butt. But yeah. the, the butt never came. I think he just got tired and forgot. Good day, sandwiches are ready Maybe in the kitchen. Maybe he had like a hard experience recently too or something. It, just, it felt like it that. It seemed like he had a like bitterness. A dark place. It seemed like he was figuring things out and he was using the funerals like the time God to do it. God had turned his back on him or something. Yeah. There is nothing. <laughs> Stop talking to people. But we definitely know from, uh, at least if you just even go by the listeners in the show and people that have submitted stories, there's absolutely more to life than- well, It seems like they can see us- but we can't really communicate directly with them unless we're a medium. Or you have a tool. It does seem like through music and, you know, meaningful... Messages. Experiences. Dreams. There's some kind of communication mm -hmm. back and forth. Or sometimes phones. Right, like phone calls from the dead. The actually... Speaking of which, were we going to end this episode yeah, with hold on, Becca, hold on. <laughs> this is a, weird that this came up. Is this another synchronicity, Jeremy? Because I'm about no, to... No, 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 no. This, this, so, uh, puke. Last thing that I was going to mention, I forgot to mention this Oscar story, his UFO chicken. Yeah. Sorry for the title. He, he'd heard the phone calls from the dead. He'd what? Heard. He had heard phone calls from the dead uh, episode that we did, and he just had this experience that related. He said he had two experiences where an unknown number called him. It was a woman crying, just crying in Spanish, saying, help me. No. Oh. The first time, something extremely tragic happened to my brother, and then the second time, something really tragic happened to my girlfriend's father. Could be a big coincidence, but when Chris brought up the phenomenon, it made me think twice. You know, you have heard those weird kind of like omen calls. Yeah. Is it the beyond reaching out? Is it some kind of life force entity that lives between the veils? Like the Mothman idea, Ingrid Cold. 
Or is it a trickster sort of thing? Or is it a trickster? Yeah, it's interesting. But these hopeful stories, I think there's something real to them. But we can't know. If they're tricksters, they're not doing a very good job because they're offering a lot of hope and peace to people. Usually tricksters are trying to create some sort of mayhem. Yeah, unless they're playing the long game. You know, and have, <laughs> so have when they die, of, they're like, we tricked you. We gotcha. <laughs> They'd have to know very personal things about not just their lives, but... Interpersonal is it stuff. Brady? Brady. Like, that's an internal thing, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird that... I wonder I wonder if you ever talked to him when he was like before an event or well, something. Well, that, that's the thing I did want to say. It is interesting because like he said, he never told his parents that he listened to this. So mm-hmm. even if the, the medium was somehow reading from the parents, picking this up from the parents, you know, you always hear the skeptical argument of mediums. They're just picking up body language and somehow getting these right. m- amazing details. Or the other argument that it's not actually supernatural in the way of spirit, but more of like telepathy. Yeah. But obviously yeah, that, his parents that weren't parents aware. Know that. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is strange. There's a distance disconnect that makes that weird attribute. I would like to know, Brady, if you ever said anything out loud or can your departed ones read your thoughts and your intentions? I guess they oh, probably yeah. could, but mm-hmm. that's a little weird. <laughs> it's a little weird <laughs> if they can. Yeah. How much do... Do they know? What's grandma think looking at me when I'm... She knows your heart, John. She knows my... When you're what, John? I just like all the time. When you're what, John? (laughs) All the time making (laughs) choices. Uh, Anyway, we can't know for sure, obviously, about anything. Like we say, we don't know, but I think we all believe that there is... This is not the end for sure. Yeah, it's impossible to know for sure the details after, but there's... Makeup of this matrix. Definitely enough compelling evidence to know that it seems like. Yeah, and the longer we explore within the belief hole, the more possibilities seem to spread out from this tree of life. Absolutely. That's for sure. Yeah. Makes this world seem kind of dull compared to, I mean, not this world, but like the the average, the, or just the, the societal standards. The mainstream view. Yeah. The news tells you the world is. Yeah. It's so like one dimensional when it seems like there's infinite dimensions and infinite possibilities. We've forgotten the magic that our ancestors talked about all the time. We've forgotten know? the Goonies magic, let alone the magic <laughs> of our ancestors. Even like the 90s magic we were allowed to yeah, have is 90, gone. Like 80s, 90s magic was still an acceptable imagination. Well, right. I think the constant barrage of information and the never ending news cycle has just wiped away all there's magic no and imagination. left. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. We used to have to wait for things and like to get a hold of people. There was this space where your mind could wander and imagine and And not everything was instant. Time existed. Sometimes I I want the internet to end. I know. Just to think your own thoughts again. Yeah, just to see what would happen. Like I'd like time to slow down. I feel like that is a big part of time. This sensation of time picking Although up. Although I talked to someone the other day who's never on his phone and is very disconnected, and he feels the same thing. It could be the compression. The older you get, the compression of the That's feeling true, of time yeah. because you've lived a lot longer. We should ask younger people, like in high school. Do you feel yeah. like time's going fast for you? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like, but I feel like I felt that way since high school. I feel like it's been speeding up. But think about it. High school, that was when, boom, cell phones, end of high school, like just came out pretty much. Well, but I mean, we you, didn't have, you had like the big box They ones. weren't smartphones. Well, they were getting there. We college, texted a lot though. College, we had the first iPhone. I didn't have an iPhone in college. I mean, generally we as the human race. So I don't count myself among them. Brian called it the Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Hall, yeah. what did he call the people at the airport the other day? Uh, Mongos? Mongos. Mongos. <laughs> <laughs> Make a left to avoid the Mongo crowd. Good man. He's in yeah. town right now. We should hang out. Yeah, I'd like to see him. All right, on that note. Yeah, let's tell you how you can get more into the hole if you're interested. And thank those who are here. Yes. If you'd like to hear more stories, more crazy full episodes. Yeah, we will get to you. There's tons of you out there who have submitted stories. Tarnia, Robert, Marsha, Zach, Cody, many others. So they'll be Going in, in the be, trash. Yeah, you'll, you'll be in the hole eventually. <laughs> yeah, they'll be in the hole. But I'm talking about more stories, more episodes that you guys haven't heard, those of you who haven't signed up yet, for the expansion if you want to get Deeper into the hole and have a little more hole in your life. A lot more hole. Go to Bleefull.com. There's a lot more Double hole there. The hole. You can go way deep. Go to Bleefull.com. Okay, click on the... Uh, I'm not trying to go that direction. Okay. It just sounds weird. Go to Bleefull.com. Click on the big red expansion button and uh, we'll see you in there. We'll be hanging out in the hole with a lot more crazy, fascinating stories, research, and lore. Just like our main episode. Yeah. So come over, check it out. And let's say thank you to some of our uh, recent signups, shall we? Yes, let's do. Are we, are we, are we going to do it? Cue it up, John. Get us on that cruise boat. Ah, yes. The warm Caribbean waters of Bleethole Land. Welcome members, new members. Thank you for supporting the whole. Starting with the incredible Ingrid Dean. Oh, welcome, Ingrid. Welcome, welcome to the show. <laughs> John's got it live today. I like it. John's doing the sound effects live. Yes, I am. Just for you. Yes, and jingles. Yes, welcome in, Ingrid. And surprisingly enough, our very next patron was... 
another Ingrid. Ingrid Harrington. Ingrid Harrington. So good to see you. What are the chances? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for supporting the show. Welcome to the hole. Excellent. Thank you to Caleb Kempster. All right. Welcome in, Caleb. Caleb, bringing it into the hole. Thank you to Tristan Dennison. I like your venison, Tristan Dennison. Oh, gosh. Words that rhyme with Dennison. Thank you to Debbie Pinion. All right. Got a great yes, opinion yes, for everything yes. in. Oh, gosh. I'm Man. sorry. John, I need you to say some things so it doesn't sound like me making <laughs> terrible jokes the whole time. <laughs> Mike Tojek. Welcome, Mike Tojek. Sounds like a futuristic podiatrist. That's feet, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Thanks Welcome, for being buddy. here. We appreciate it, man. Thank you to Benjamin Collins. Hi, Ben. Welcome to the hole. Nice. Come awesome. on down. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Benjamin. Good to have you. Yeah, I like that. See? Good with your voice. Welcome to Lena McClooney. Not to be confused with George McClooney. Lena McClooney. It's not a person. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in, Lena. We like you. <laughs> Welcome, Lena. Great to have you. Nadra Barbieri. Barbieri. Nadra. Nadra. Uh, Nadra Barbieri. Welcome. Welcome in. Thanks, did we, Nadra. Did we pronounce that right? Great name. Welcome to the hole. We love you. Welcome to Gerardius Prime. <laughs> awesome. Freshly yes, back yes, from his yes, yes, mission yes. to swaddle the stars, to conquer the planets. Is that off for um, Optimus Prime? Yes. Um, he just, transforms. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Welcome, Lee Ollier. Lee Ollier. Lee Euler? Lee Ollier. I like that name. Welcome. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks for oiling our hole. Sh -sh 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 Shannon. Shannon, <laughs> come on down. Shawshank Shannon. Shawshank <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> Imprisoned unjustly. Yeah. Awesome. Four years. Yes. Welcome yes, to yes, Logan yes. Gillis. Logan Gillis. Swimming the seas. <laughs> Sorry. Swimming the seas and breathing underwater. Welcome, L Logan Gillis. Thanks, Logan. Welcome to Courtney Goodwin. Welcome in, Courtney. Goodwin. Talk about a double whammy of a last name. Yes. Victories yes. on both counts. Goodwin Good win it was. I'm a little jealous of your last name. Goodwin's all the way. Yes. Amy Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett. What? Who's Coney Barrett? She's a the Supreme judge? Court justice. Oh, all right. Well, thanks for joining the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she probably knows that. Amy I guess Barrett. that a lot. Amy Barrett. Welcome in, Amy. We Welcome love you. Welcome to this Amy Barrett. Supreme Court justice or not. Patrick Ironham. Patrick Ianham. Ianham. Welcome to the show. A Excellent. delicious roast for yes. any meal. Awesome. Ham? No, no. Yes. I'm sorry. Welcome, Patrick. We're glad to have you. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, wait. Yes, yes. John doesn't do this live anymore. <laughs> it must be Patrick Lanham, because the next one is Patrick Lanham. Oh. It's lowercase l. Weird geniuses. Tina Frederick. Tina Friedrich. Yes. Welcome to the hall. Thanks, Tina. Oh. So good to have you here. Welcome to be here. Erica Wolf. Oh. Welcome to the Believe Hole. Dalton Bickle. Dalton. Yes. You're not in a pickle if you were with Dalton Bickle, because he'll get you out of the jam. William Anthony. William All right. Anthony. What a normal name you have. That's terrific. Strong like a Caesar. Joy Tapley. Gleeful Joy Tapley. Dancing all around with those happy feet. We're joyful to have you here, Joy. Awesome. Yes. Megan McMinn. Oh, Megan she's a familiar name. Megan McMinn. Welcome, welcome back. Welcome, welcome back, to Megan McMinn. Welcome to the hole, Megan. A special member, as always. Joe Rosselli. Welcome Joe. to the hole. Joe. Welcome in. Joe. 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 Excellent. Kaylin or Keelan McCauley. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes Hi. your brain just stops, you Macaulay, know? Macaulay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Kaylin, Keelan. Welcome in. Great to have you here. Here's a hug. Oh, yeah, sorry, I keep scrolling around. I keep Go losing down. track. Go down. No, down. There. Ah. Ah, you were just there. It's right here. Okay. Sarah Chandler. Sarah Chandler. Sarah, it's Chandler. The Chandler? I'm guessing Chandler. Chandler. Either way, we're happy to have you. Love you, Sarah. Yes. And now the fantastic, the furry, the funny, Brian King. It's a different Brian. Is it? Yeah, this is Brian with an eye, not my childhood friend. Really? Oh. Yeah, he's already a patron. Welcome, other Brian Are you King. Sure? Yeah, Brian with my Brian's with a Y. He probably spelled his own name right. You're in good company. Yes, you may not be furry. I'm sorry if I said that incorrectly, but <laughs> welcome, Brian King. Excellent. Yes. And now we have Jeremy Simmons. Yes. All right. Jeremy Simmons. I've welcome always, to the whole. Always brother. wanted Jeremy Simmons. Welcome in, sir. The water is warm in the hole. Holly Hensman. Hi, Holly. Holly Hensman is a great comic book name. That's, get those that's a good name. Uh -huh. I appreciate your name. Uh, Suicidal kitty. Meow, meow, meow. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> this is great. I'm sad. Aw. Welcome in. I hope you feel better. Yeah. Welcome, Suicidal Kitty. Chris Patterson. Chris Patterson. Getting after it, son. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Welcome to, to the, the hole. Hole. Breezy. Come on in, Breezy. Batten Come down on the in. <laughs> Batten down the hatches. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to have you. <laughs> David Lanktree. David Lanktree. It's a good name. It's a great name. Lanky Tree. 
There's like six people left listening. And three of them are us. <laughs> Thank you if you're here. Even if you're not yet a member, we appreciate you being here. <laughs> the other ones are the people that haven't we haven't read yet. <laughs> <laughs> Their names. All right, guys, we're coming to you. Uh, thank you to Anna Guevara. Beautiful name. Exotic name. I love the name Anna and Guevara. Guevara. Welcome to Megan. Megan, uh, first name only. It's cool, like Sting. Yes, welcome, Megan. We're happy to have you here. And we love you, Megan. Aww. Chrysosto Madrigal. Chrysosto Madrigal. Madrigal. Nice name. Madrigal. I've heard that oh. before. Nice welcome, to have Chrysosto. you here, buddy. Great to have you, buddy. Chrysosto. Martin Henderson. Mar- All right. Mar- Martin. Welcome, Marty. It's great to have you, brother. Excellent. Excellent. Paul Lafleche. The flesh. The flesh, yes. yes. That's like yes. a torturer. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure he's not. <laughs> I hope. Welcome, Paul. Welcome, great, everybody. Great name. Great to have you, brother. Christine Struck, Rushing. Nice. Ooh, Christine Struck. That's a big one. Christine Struck. Violent. Violent name. Violent. Struck, Rushing, Struck. Kale Mantis. Oh, nice. Yes. Name. Eating those greens, turning your head in all directions like the mantis can do, <laughs> unlike other insects. Segmented head. Welcome, Kale Mantis. We're thrilled to have you. And a fun name to boot. Riding on the train with William Wheeler. William Wheeler. And all his wheels. It's great to have you, William. This is really unoriginal. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're having trouble coming with fun brain farts. The final for today James Kovich. Come over here, Kovich. Yes. Sounds like the next Starship captain. Sounds like a football quarterback. Yes. James Kovich coming on yes. down the green yes. with a mile-long arm. I don't know. That was. <laughs> I watch a lot of football. <laughs> He's running down the green with a mile-long arm. Yes. James Kovich, yes. glad to have you here. Thank you, everybody who stuck around yes. reading these names. I know we were a little, a little silly, a little Thank uncreative you. today, but uh, yes. really appreciate all the support. John yes. is still yesing. Yes. It's just addicted to those. Thanks for being in the hole with us. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for here. If you want double the fun, double the content, double the strange, definitely come on over to the expansion. Welcome to your weird world of of the hole. God, that was bad. We're in trouble towards the end. I know. My brain just feels kind of. Our brains are tired. Join the expansion for double the content. Yeah, it's gonna be super fun this week, especially guys. Just quick recap here. What's going on today? We got terrible scary horror stories that you don't want to hear of things inside your house yeah everyone can relate to that feeling mm-hmm. even though probably not many people have actually had intruders in their home at mm-hmm. least physical ones we will have some supernatural some creature folkloric entities that exist depending on what you believe inside the home and the, i think the idea of realizing that someone's been in there for quite some time and you've been spending time in your home that's what's creepy. not knowing you've been cohabitating yeah. mm. with another spirit or living we should do an episode sometime on the frogging thing that would be fun mm-hmm. absolutely all space creepers yeah all right guys come on over the expansion we'll see you there it doesn't have to end the fun can continue absolutely forever stay spooky no we can't everyone says that okay stay creepy keep having scrapes keep having scrapes and we will see you next time on the belief hole